for means. The question is, what is the Planck temperature, the limit of potential heat? And how does it relate to the limit of potential heat? All right, let's see. That's a, that's a kind of a physics question. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. So first of all, what is temperature? So temperature is the, the energy with which molecules, for example, in a gas or any other material are uh, uh, the, the, the energy that the molecules, the average energy that the molecules and gas have. So the, when you heat things up, what it means is you're putting energy into the material, and that means that the particles that make up the material are running around more and more quickly. They have higher and higher kinetic energy, energy of motion. So the, um, uh, and so what happens is that, you know, uh, the, the standard thing we see with typical materials is that we go from the molecules are not running around very quickly, and they're all getting stuck together and the thing is a solid. The molecules are running around more quickly, it becomes a liquid. Eventually, the molecules are running around so quickly that they don't, the forces of attraction between them are not enough to kind of pull them together into a, into a blob of stuff like a liquid, and they just become a gas. Okay, so what you might think is, okay, you can keep going and just heat the thing up, just keep heating it up forever and ever and ever. And so what goes wrong if you start making things hotter and hotter? So for example, I don't know, the temperature of the center of the sun is perhaps 10 million degrees centigrade. Um, that's pretty hot. That's also the kind of temperatures one needs if one is trying to make uh, fusion, if one's trying to get hydrogen um, atoms to fuse together to make energy, um, either in a, in a fusion reactor or in a hydrogen bomb, um, one needs millions of degrees centigrade uh, of, of energy. And what, what happens at millions of degrees centigrade is that the hydrogen atoms are going so quickly that the fact that the hydrogen atoms, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms normally repel each other electrically, you overcome that force of repulsion by the things just ramming together with enough speed that they can then uh, merge and produce a lot of energy when they fuse. So the question is, when you heat things up, uh, how hot can you make things? Well, uh, the, well, all kinds of things might happen when you make things very hot. Uh, so one of, the, one of the issues is um, if you make, uh, let's see how to explain this, the, the couple of different things. Um, so when you have a lot, of, a lot of heat, that means there's a lot of energy somewhere. So some little piece of gas is really, really hot. It means it has a really large amount of energy. Okay, so one of the things that happens when you have a lot of energy is it's, that produces a lot of gravity as well. So normally we think of gravity as being, oh, the Earth has a big mass, and so it will gravitationally attract anything to that mass. Um, and the, the sort of simplest formulas for gravity just say the gravity is proportional to the mass of the of the object that is the the the, the, mul the two masses of the objects multiplied together but in fact there's an equivalence between mass and energy and gravity is also produced by energy as well as by mass so you know famous formula is e equals mc squared the energy is equal to the 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 the, the total energy of something um, if it, at least if it's staying still, if it isn't moving around, total energy is the mass times the speed of light squared. Um, and let's see, we can, um, that most of the time, so energy, you take an object and just move it around. It'll have a certain energy associated with motion. That energy is roughly a half times the mass times the velocity squared. That's the standard formula for kinetic energy. But the, there's also an intrinsic energy associated with the object. And if you were to somehow get rid of the mass in the object, then you could convert that to a certain amount of energy. So for example, a place where that happens is, uh, uh, let's say you have an electron and an anti-electron, a positron, and you let them annihilate each other. They can 
they can interact, they can analyze each other, and they can produce two photons. And so then, in a sense, you're, you're taking the mass, let's say you've just got this electron and the positron, and they're just hanging out near each other. Actually, there's a weird thing called positronium, which is a kind of atom where the nucleus of the atom, the quotes nucleus, is a positron, a positively charged analog of the electron, and then there's an electron sort of going around outside it. Uh, positronium uh, is, can be stable, but if you just have the electron and the positron sitting there and they just sort of amble towards each other, there's no real velocity involved, but eventually they, they, they come sufficiently close that they react and you end up getting two photons out. Okay, so in that case, you're converting the rest energy of the electron and the positron to the pure energy of photons. Photons have zero mass, and so sort of everything that is there is just the energy of a photon, not its rest mass. And so that formula E equals mc squared tells you the energy of those two photons that were produced by the annihilation of an electron and the positron at rest. Um, but in general, the, the, the full formula, um, if you're into these things, is um, E squared equals P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. So what that formula says is the energy uh, is, has a term that depends on the momentum and it has, depends on the rest mass. And so the total energy of something depends on some, how much it's moving around, that's a sort of kinetic piece, and it's intrinsic energy associated with the, the rest mass of the thing. Okay, so as far as gravity is concerned, it doesn't really care very much where the energy is coming from, whether it's coming from rest mass or whether it's coming from momentum, it basically treats those as kind of the same type of thing, a little bit different in detail, but basically the same kind of thing. And those are both sources of gravity. And so in the, the sort of official version of this is Einstein's equations, which uh, represent gravity in terms of the curvature of space-time. And the curvature of space-time is proportional to a thing called the energy momentum tensor, which is sort of a combination of energy and mass and momentum and so on. But in any case, the basic bottom line is um, energy, like mass, is a source of gravity. Okay, so imagine we have this gas in a box and we heat the gas up really, really high temperature. It's going to have a lot of energy. That energy is going to be a source of gravity. And so what will happen is that as we make the energy sufficiently high, that there, there will be so much uh, that the... The, 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 the energy associated with this gas will be such that it will produce, there'll be a huge amount of gravity associated with the energy of this gas. And eventually, it'll get to the point where there's so much gravity that it uh, basically makes the space around the thing kind of implode on itself. So how does that happen? So, and, and essentially form a black hole. So uh, what happens there? Well. The, the, the more gravity there is, let's say there's an object that has a certain mass and it has a certain size, it, has, it produces a certain amount of gravity on its surface. And now you ask the question, how difficult is it to escape from that thing? So you, you fire a rocket up and you're trying to get away from the gravity of that, that object. How fast do you have to go to escape the gravity of that object? For the Earth, if you go more than 25,000 miles an hour, you will escape from the gravity of the Earth, and you can have a spacecraft that goes at that speed. It'll, it'll, if you go more than that speed, you can just wander off into the, into the, into the rest of the solar system or into, into the rest of the cosmos, so to speak. Uh, for the Sun, um, it, at the surface of the Sun, the escape velocity is somewhat bigger. It's 100,000 miles an hour. So that's the speed you have to get to if you're going to escape from the gravitational pull of the sun from the solar system, for example. I think for the, um, uh, for the whole galaxy, it's about a million miles an hour. But in any case, the, the question is, if you have an object that has enough mass uh, concentrated in a small enough area, a uh, small enough volume, the, the gravity is such that the escape velocity will get larger and larger and larger, and eventually the escape velocity velocity is more than the speed of light. And since you can't get something to go faster than the speed of light, that means nothing can escape from that area 
And that's what it means to form an event horizon, which is what defines a black hole. You, can, you can't, nothing can escape from that event horizon because if you try to sort of fire a rocket out, you, the fastest you could ever fire a rocket out would be at the speed of light, but even things at the speed of light are pulled back in by the gravity of that object. So if you make something sufficiently hot, you would eventually get to the point where there will be so much gravity produced by the energy of that thing that you will end up forming a black hole. And uh, that's, that's sort of a limit on how, on the temperature that you can reach for, for things. And the, uh, well, let's see, that, that's, uh, there, there are other limits to temperature. So one of the questions is, it, what will happen to space-time, for example, if you just make it, if you put more and more energy into space-time, what happens? Well, in our models, we can, let me think about this for a second. Uh, yeah, I think, hmm. I mean, I think what happens is basically you form lots of, you form little black holes or other much more bizarre features of space-time. Um, you, you're essentially having it, having it be the case. So, so roughly the reason this happens is uh, in our models of space from our physics project, which we think really is how physics works, at the smallest scales, space is just made of a giant network of points. We have this idea that space is sort of continuous, we can move around anywhere we want, but in our model of physics, that isn't the way it works. Instead, there's this underlying structure at a very, very small scale, trillions and trillion, trillions of, of meters in size. There's a, very, uh, there's a structure where space is this kind of giant network of points. And uh, what happens is, if you say, well, what's the shortest path from one place in space to another through this kind of network? Um, well, if in, in many cases, that shortest path is basically just a pure straight line. But what happens is that energy is associated with the amount of activity in this network. So this network is continually getting rewritten. In fact, that's kind of how space is knitted together. It wasn't for the fact that the network is locally getting rewritten all over the place. The different parts of space would never communicate with each other. And we wouldn't have something that is, behaves like space that we can move through and so on. But in any case, it's sort of continually being knitted together. But the rate at which it's being knitted together in any particular region of space is, in our models, determined by the energy at that place in space. So the, the higher the energy, the faster the rate of kind of rewriting space that, that is happening. And so that process of rewriting means that if you look at the shortest path from one place to another, it is deflected by all that rewriting that's going on. Essentially, if you were to look at kind of what's the fastest way to get through the network from one place to another, if there's a lot of little pieces of network in there and a lot of sort of density of network, then it's kind of, it, um, uh, you, you, you're kind of you, you tend to want to go through that place where there's more network in some sense. And that's, that's why these, the, the, the sort of the shortest path is deflected and that's kind of ultimately the explanation for the reason for the force of gravity and the deflection of what are called GD6, shortest paths in space. So in the case where you have a sufficiently high energy density, all kinds of crazy things will happen with those shortest paths. And I'm not absolutely sure what, uh, what would happen if you just inject more and more, you just rewrite this network faster and faster and faster, I think what will happen is just that the shortest paths will all get captured into that region where everything's getting rewritten. It's like all the action in the universe is going on just in this one place. And so kind of all paths that you follow um, will just get dragged to that place in the universe. And that's, that's sort of what will happen as you try and make the temperature um, incredibly high to put an incredibly large amount of energy there. Now, the actual value of the temperature you need is some ridiculous trillions and trillions and trillions of degrees centigrade to achieve anything like that. But that's, I think, the final thing that happens. Now, there is one funny thing. Uh, in the very early universe, uh, 
temperatures, well, were effectively a lot higher. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be explaining that. that that's, that's a different story, perhaps. But maybe one other thing to mention about temperature. Um, in, so when you heat things up, there are your you're effectively, as, as things are going faster and faster, boy, is this going to be easy to explain? I'm going to try and tell you about why people thought at one time there might be a maximum temperature uh, and not associated with this effect about gravity and making black holes and things like that, but a quite different kind of maximum temperature. Um, and yeah, so the idea is this. The normally you say, well, I've got a bunch of molecules and they're bouncing around and we're making it hotter. Eventually, those molecules, things will get so hot that the energy that's that's um, uh, binding the electrons in those in those binding the, the atoms and the molecules together, the electrons to the nuclei of the atoms, you'll have so much energy associated with things bouncing around and colliding with each other and so on, that you will no longer be able to keep the electrons bound to nuclei of atoms and the things will get torn apart into a plasma. That's what fire is, 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 a, is a plasma where the, where the um, uh, nuclei of atoms have been separated from their electrons. So that's the first thing that happens. Um, now, the... The question is, you, you might think when things are sufficiently hot, oh, it's just a bunch of nuclei bouncing around. But here's a weird thing that can happen. Uh, let's say that as you, that there are various ways to make new kinds of particles. Not, let's, let's say that you have, so, so when you heat things up, uh, normally you go from you know, ordinary matter to plasmas. And if you heat things up even further, so in a plasma, you've torn the electrons away from the nuclei of atoms. So if you go to even higher temperatures, you will start tearing the nuclei of atoms apart. And in particular, you can kind of tear apart the pieces of protons and neutrons. And so what, what happens is you get what's called a quark-gluon plasma. What's inside protons and neutrons are quarks and these gluons, which are particles that, that uh, get exchanged between quarks that kind of pull the quarks together to, to sort of bind them into a proton or something. So at sufficiently high temperatures, you get this kind of quark gluon plasma. That's the current belief about what happens, and that's been observed in some particle accelerators, at least to, to some extent. Uh, you get very, very small amounts of quark gluon plasma for very short amounts of time. You can kind of tell that it's this kind of blob of, of, of stuff at a very high temperature. Um, and uh, okay, so that, that's what people think happens. Now, uh, but nevertheless, you've gone up to this very high temperature, everything has turned into a bunch of quarks and gluons. Um, but the question is, what would happen, but, but you have this high temperature and the energy associated with the temperature is just going into the kinetic energy of the particles. It's just making these particles, maybe it tears apart the, the, the atoms, maybe it tears apart the protons, but it's still basically the energy that you keep on putting in just goes into making particles run around faster and faster. Okay, there's one weird thing that could happen. What if there are more kinds of particles that you could produce? And what if, as you put more energy into the system, instead of that energy going to particles running around, it goes into making new kinds of particles that have higher masses? So I remember I, I said that, that mass and energy have this equivalence that's that that's what E equals MC squared is telling you. That tells you that you could take like that positron and the electron and they could annihilate each other, produce sort of pure energy, um, at least the photons that don't have a rest mass. Um, you can also go the other way around. You could take those photons that are just sort of energy, no rest mass, and, um, and, and have them interact and produce an electron and a positron that have a mass. So just as you can go from mass to energy, so you can go from energy to mass. And so as you pump more energy into this system that is uh, at an so increasingly high temperature, you would might think that all that energy you pump it in is making just the particles run around faster and faster. But there's another possibility, which is if there are more kinds of particles you can make, 
you might just be making new kinds of particles rather than having that energy go into your existing particles running around faster and faster. And there was a model back in the 1960s um, when people had different views about how particle physics works. There was a model which said that the number of kinds of particles should increase exponentially with their mass. So in other words, as right now we know about some number of kinds of particles, but that there will be more and more and more and more particles. And, and, and as you increase the, the mass, the numbers of types of particles that you would get would just get incredibly much larger. So, I, I mean, in fact, that theory uh, was somewhat related to string theory, which is a, has been kind of a, a popular mathematical development in mathematical physics in the last particularly 30 years. It's sort of related to that. Um, the, uh, the buzzword for this is the Hagedorn temperature. Um, but the idea was that instead of energy going into making uh, particles go around faster and faster, the energy would go into making more particles. And what could happen is if you have an exponentially increasing number of kinds of particles, you eventually will get to the point where the more that you, you try and put more energy in and all you'll get is more particles, more new kinds of particles produced, not, uh, not something which is, is sort of traditional temperature with kinetic energy. So that's a, a different form of maximum temperature that doesn't seem to be the way that it actually works.